it's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this uh, great evening and this great function that the museum has put on. And I would like to begin by just thanking the few people that I've worked directly with. Uh, John thanked, I had a list of people to thank, but John beat me to it. But I would like to thank Dag uh, Spicer, who's sitting in the front row, and Kirsten, where's Kirsten Teslev? They have been terrific. They're gonna do some great things for this museum in the future, so I'll, I'll wait and see what's next. Our agenda is I'd like to make a few general remarks. I'm going to then introduce the panel. Each panelist is going to take five to 10 minutes of discussing various aspects of computer chess that they've been involved in and would like to discuss. I may ask them a few questions myself when we're finished with all of them. Following that, the audience will be invited to ask questions. And we will have microphones in this row and in this row. And if you want to ask a question, please come down <clears throat> into your row and, and wait your turn. Each, each uh, person will have one question and one question only, because I think we'll have a lot of questions. This, is a subject that provokes a lot of questions. The exciting thing about this computer chess is the people that have been involved in it. And I'd just like to go back through it just a little bit. For those of you that are computer scientists that are studying all the various areas of computer science, computer chess has touched upon many of the leading names that have gone into other areas as well. We can talk about Babbage, who discussed his analytical engines, but he managed to work in a little bit of discussion about how computers might play chess in his, in his writings. We go on to Alan Turing, who, of course, was famous for his work in the theory of uh, computation, to Claude Shannon, to von Neumann, who discussed the Minimax algorithm and game plane algorithms, to Norbert Wiener, who speculated on how computers might play, to Nobel Prize winner Herb Simon, who won the Nobel Prize not for chess, but for, for his work in economics. To John McCarthy, who's hiding at the end of our board, who pioneered the programming language Lisp and was one of the first contributors of a real working program. To Donald Knuth, who was sitting somewhere in the audience, who discussed the alpha-beta algorithm and was, it was sort of the Bible of what to expect from the alpha-beta algorithm as programs progressed. And to Ken Thompson, who was not, not clear whether he's more famous for his work in Unix or C, or with his chess program, Bell. I don't know if Ken is here tonight. I'm hoping he is, but maybe he's not. So these were the thinkers and uh, a little bit of the doers. But of course, the doers came shortly after. And there were some terrific doers, from Alex Bernstein at IBM, who developed the first program, to Alan Kotek, who worked with John McCarthy on the a program that wound up playing against the Russians, to Richard Greenblatt at MIT, to David Slate and Larry Atkin, to Thompson again. I can't get away from Thompson, to Robert Hyatt to Hans Berliner, to the Spracklins. Now, if you talk about uh, chess, seems to be a man's world. But Kathy Spracklin was the exception to the rule. Kathy was a tiger and was the brains behind the Sargon chess program that was the first major commercial chess program to, to be widely distributed. Uh, and of course, on top of all these names that were the doers, we're fortunate to have with us Murray Campbell, who is one of the great doers. Murray is the, one of the main members of the Deep Blue team, which was, consisted of Murray and C.B. Shu, Thomas and Antha Raman, and Joe Hone, and then they had a whole sprinkling of other people that helped them. In addition to this motley bunch, which is a tremendous collection of talent, we have David Levy sitting at the table here. David was famous as a writer, as a critic, as a skeptic, as an organizer, and as one of my good friends for many years. Uh, my feeling is I've been involved in this project since 1970. It's been a great, exciting 35 years. 
And this, perhaps, is the culmination of it. I think I'm entitled to two quick short stories about the years that I've been involved in computer chess. And one of them happened near here in Napa Valley. I think you guys all know what Napa Valley is famous for. And there's a guy named Gallo that has a vineyard in Napa Valley. And he was a very gracious guy, and he was a bit interested in chess. And so he decided, well, he had been having chess tournaments every summer for a while. He'd invite <laughs> chess players from all around America to come to his vineyard and play in a tournament. And of course, he's out to promote his wine. And so as they played chess, he would spruce them up a little bit with a little <laughs> wine. And the degree to which they took the tournament serious was always a, a question mark. So one year, 1975, one of the guys that snuck into the vineyard was a computer. And of course, nobody took computers very serious in 1975. But lo and behold, David Slate and Larry Atkin and Keith Gorland, who's hiding in the audience, <coughs> Keith is somewhere way over here. Keith was David, 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 Larry and Keith entered their program in this vineyard tournament in the class B section. And the class B section is typically the level of the best player in every high school probably has a class B player or two. And lo and behold, it won the first game. And its opponent, of course, was a little bit spruced up. And so <laughs> these things happen. It won the second game. Well, these things happen. The third game, the fourth game, and the fifth game, it went undefeated. It won all five games. And lo and behold, it was the champion of this class B tournament. Well, the one thing that has happened over all these years is a pattern of denial in the human race. <laughs> and lo and behold, nobody could really take it serious that this program won the tournament because everybody was a little bit tipped up. <laughs> so Slate, Atkin, and Gorlin went back to Chicago to Northwestern University and prepared their next strike at the human race, which was the Minnesota State Championship, if I am correct. And lo and behold, I think their program may have won that championship. Is that correct, Keith? You don't remember, OK. Well, the important thing was that the skeptics in, 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 uh, in, in Napa Valley just couldn't believe what happened. But it did happen. That was 1975. And from 1975 on, computers started to play at the level of what might consider an expert chess player. My second event that I wanted to talk about happened with the chess program Bell, Ken's, Ken Thompson's program Bell. And it's a story about Zook the Book. Zook the Book was a New York chess player. In New York, there's a lot of chess players that wander the streets and will play for a quarter against anybody willing to gamble a quarter with them. If they want to gamble more, all the better. And these guys are very sneaky guys. And Zook the Book was one of these guys. He'll play anybody for anything. Anyways, he came to the tournament the evening that we were having the second or third round of a world championship in New York, I believe at the New York Hilton. And he came up to Ken Thompson. He looked him in the eye. I'm not sure if he's looking Thompson in the eye or Bell in the eye. <laughs> but he said, if I win 10 in a row, do I own its soul? Okay. So, Zook the Book, of course, Thompson wasn't sure what to say. Zook, Zook the Book's, the, the reason he was called Zook the Book was that he had memorized every opening line that one can memorize from the, the opening. And he was very good at opening books. Zook the Book sat down, hoping to own Bell's soul very shortly. This was about 12 at night. Ken was very tired. He wanted to go home. But Zook the Book wanted to play. And Ken was always very gracious and would, have, would, would take on all comers to Bell at any time. After Zook the Book had been beaten seven or eight games in a row <laughs> and getting more and more depressed, he finally got up and sheepishly walked away. And Bell went to bed shortly thereafter. 
So those are my two stories, sort of highlights on my, my years in computer chess. I'd like to introduce the panel now, and I'm going to take a minute to go through each one. Each one has an extremely uh, prestigious background. I want to introduce Ed Feigenbaum first. Ed is in, in the second place here. Ed was uh, born in Weehawken, New Jersey, and completed all his degrees at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, finishing his PhD in 1960. And he's currently a professor emeritus at Stanford University. Uh, those of us in computer science probably consider him the father of expert systems, if that's fair to say. Is that fair to say? Fair to say. And <laughs> And when I was a graduate student, uh, which I'm just, just a year or two older, or maybe three, it's not clear, uh, I read his book, Computers and Thought, and that was very much a part of my education. He's also authored a book called Applications of AI in Organic Chemistry, the Dendril Program. And one of his great contributions to computer science was his Dendril Program for analyzing molecules. He also co-authored a book called The Fifth Generation, AI in Japan's Challenge to the Computer World, and he did that with Pamela McCordick, who we've seen uh, for writing uh, about data generals computers and uh, prior to that. Ed is a member of the National Academy of Engineering since 1986. He's a fellow of the AAAI. In 1995, he won the prestigious Turing Award from the ACM. And he received an exceptional civilian service award from the United States Air Force in 1997. Uh, Ed, do we give him a hand? <laughs> At the end of the table, we have John McCarthy, who was born in Boston in 1927. He grew up in the, on the West Coast in LA got his undergraduate degree from Caltech in 1948, and wound up going to Princeton thereafter, getting his PhD in 1951. 1951, that's a long time ago. <laughs> he taught, taught at Princeton, he taught at Dartmouth, he taught at MIT, and he spent most of his career here in Stanford. He's currently a professor emeritus at Stanford. Ed is a fellow of the Computer History Museum and has played a part in the, the, the advising and uh, development of this museum, an important role. Along with Ed Feigenbaum, he has been awarded the ACM Turing Award back in 1971. He's been awarded the Kyoto Prize in 1988. He was awarded the National Medal of Science, which is quite an achievement, in 1990. He's a member of the National Academy of Arts and Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Science. So it's a trick to be a member of all three of those organizations. There's probably very, very few people in the world that are in all three. Now, Ed Feigenbaum might have been considered the father of expert systems, but expert systems is a sub-problem of artificial intelligence. And I think it's fair to say that John can be considered the father of artificial intelligence. And I think that's a, an incredible feather in his hat. He developed LISP in the 1950s. He proposed an XML-like language in the 1980s. He co-authored the Kotak McCarthy chess program in the middle 60s, and that was the program that played against the Russians. I hope we hear a little bit about that. He's written a number of books, the most uh, uh, Interesting to me is formalizing common sense, describing mental qualities to machines. He's written a paper called Making Robots, Robots Conscious of Their Mental States. And he wrote that in 1995. And he's quite interested in free will, even for robots, which was the title of another of his papers. So we may have robots that are quite, 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 uh, quite free. <laughs> Our third person I'd like to introduce is Murray Campbell. I'm sorry. <laughs> In 
third person I'd like to introduce is Murray Campbell. Now, Murray is, uh, of course, a member of the Deep Blue team. He was um, born in Canada, educated at the University of Alberta, where he received, a, where he received his undergraduate degrees. And he received his PhD from CMU in 1989. So he's 1987, I'm sorry. 1987. So he's the youngest of the bunch. He teamed up with C.B. Shu early on and Thomas and Antharam, and, and they developed a program called Deep Thought. And Murray joined IBM in 1989 with Shu and Anantharaman and they continued to develop Deep Blue Thought, which turned into Deep Blue. He's currently at IBM's T.J. Watson Research Center in, in Yorktown Heights, and he's managing the Deep Computing in Commerce Department. So we'd like to welcome Murray. And our fourth panelist is David Levy. Born in London, England in 1945, David and I have been friends since 1971. Uh, we've been through dozens and dozens of chess tournaments together, rehashed dozens and dozen, dozens of games together, and enjoyed watching the programs get better and better every year. David was the Scottish chess champ at the age of 22, and Le uh, Levy played John McCarthy a friendly game of chess at an AI workshop in Edinburgh in 1968, and he made a bet of 500 pounds with John at that time regarding the future of computer chess. We'll hear more about that when David comes and talks. In 1977, David defeated Kaisa. He defeated Chess 4.9, 4.7 later, and in 1978 won his bet from McCarthy. Uh, for several thousand dollars, and John was quite gracious in coming up with the money. I'm not sure if it set him back very much, but he paid his share. David is the author of an unbelievable number of books. I think David just types and types and types. He's written about 40 to 50 books on the subjects of computers, chess, and a wide range of subjects, and is extremely prolific. He's president of the International Computer Games Association, which is the organization in charge of organizing all the big tournaments these days. And he's been in charge of that organization for a number of years. Uh, and last but not least, from my perspective, he helped me organize the IBM, uh, Deep, uh, IBM Kasparov Deep Blue Match. And I always appreciate that very much. David? Okay, our, our next phase is to, each one of our panelists is gonna talk for five or 10 minutes, and I'm gonna ask David to be the first one. He's gonna talk about his wager, I believe. David? Thank you. Good evening. Um, as Monty said, in August 1968, John and I started a bet that became a milestone in computer chess history. We were at a cocktail party in Edinburgh during one of the machine intelligence workshops organized by Donald Mickey who was founder and head of the first AI university department in Britain. During the party, John invited me to play a game of chess, which I won. And when the game was over, John said to me, well, David, you might be able to beat me, but within 10 years, there'll be a program that can beat you. <laughs> and I was somewhat incredulous at this suggestion. I'd recently won the Scottish championship and it seemed to me that programs had a very, very long way to go before they got to master level. I knew, of course, of John's position in the world of AI, for which I had the greatest respect, but I felt that he simply underestimated how difficult it is to play master level chess. And I was also a bit brash, and I've always had a tendency to make somewhat large bets. <laughs> so I offered to make a bet with John that he was wrong. And he asked me how much I wanted to bet and I suggested 500 pounds, which at that time was a little more than $1,000. Now, put, put that into perspective, in those days, I was in my first job after graduating university, and the bet represented more than six months' salary for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, John 
wasn't quite sure whether, whether to take the bet, so he called over to our host, Donald Mickey, for advice. And Donald was sitting on the floor a few feet away from us. And he asked Donald what he thought. And Donald immediately said to John, could I take half the action? <laughs> and that, of course, gave John a lot of confidence. And so we started the bet, we shook hands, and that's how it started, with each of them betting me 250 pounds that I would lose a match to a computer program within 10 years. Later, the bet grew bigger. Uh, the following year, Seymour Papert and Ed Edward Kostrowicki joined the list of opponents. And the final amount at stake when we ended the bet was 1,250 pounds. But I never felt that I was going to be in any trouble. And it turned out that I was right. In August 1978, at the end of the 10-year period, I played a match at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto against the reigning World Computer Chess Champion program. And although they put a very pretty girl facing me to make the moves and smile at me when I was thinking, <laughs> I still won the bet. Yeah. In 1979, the following year, I made another bet for a further five years. This was with Dan McCracken and was for $1,000, and again I won. But by the time I won in 1984, I could see the writing on the wall. So I got together with Omni magazine, and I said to them that I would like to offer a prize for the first team or the first program to beat me, whenever that might be, and said that I would put up $1,000 if they would add 4,000 of their money to it. And so we did. We announced a $5,000 prize with absolutely no time limit. By 1989, the group at Carnegie Mellon University, of which Murray Campbell was a key member, had created Deep Thought, which was a veritable monster of a chess computer. And it started to score major successes in tournaments involving very strong grandmasters. It even won a tournament in California ahead of a firmer, former world champion, Mikhail Tal. And I knew then that my number was up. <laughs> and sure enough, when I was challenged to a match at the end of 1989, I was horribly crushed by a score of four to zero. But I was reasonably satisfied because I'd lasted for 21 years since the original bet. <laughs> Fortunately, Garry Kasparov was willing to take up the battle on behalf of mankind, and that gave the, the struggle to improve the best programs even more impetus. The man versus machine contest, and my bet in particular, elicited some interesting and provocative comments from various experts. In the human chess world, I encountered two diametrically opposing views from two former world champions. Mikhail Botvinnik, who was a real titan of chess, who held the world championship for 12 years during the period from 1948 to 1963 with a couple of gaps, said to me, I feel very sorry for your money, David. On the other hand, the Dutch mathematician, Max Erwe, who held the world championship title for two years from 1935 to 1937, as soon as he heard about my bet, he wanted to take a share of my side, but I said no. <laughs> and in the world of computing, Monty Newborn made a prophecy during the 1977 World Computer Chess Championship, one year before I played my first match. And this was a prophecy that was somewhat optimistic in its time frame, but it came true more quickly than I believed possible. Monty said, Grandmasters used to come to computer chess tournaments to laugh. Now they come to watch. Soon they will come to learn. <laughs> and learning they have been. Grandmasters have been employing chess programs as analysts for several years. And since 1987, huge databases of games for master play have been employed to help strong players prepare for games in tournaments against specific opponents. In addition, there are databases of end game positions that have taught the chess world the truth about some positions that have been incorrectly analyzed in the literature. In one case, a configuration of pieces in the end game that had been thought and stated in all the books to be drawn was discovered through computer analysis to be a win for one side. So Monty, now you are right. Today, grandmasters turn on their chess programs when they want to learn. Thank you. That's it, David. I could go on for three or four hours, but there are other people. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Ed Feigenbaum, you're next. I would like to... Uh, can you hear me? 
I'd like to uh, start by reiterating what a few people have said. Uh, I was a volunteer on this exhibit project, and I just want to say the staff at the Computer History Museum, uh, and Kirsten and Dag are, and their people are really fantastic. So I really appreciate what they did and the exhibit that they mounted. I also want to say that uh, looking at this audience, this audience is scary. Uh, I mean, this is like, you know, among the best people who ever practiced computer science and computer technology are sitting here in this audience. So um, it is a humbling experience to be talking to this audience. I, and the third thing I wanted to say in prelude was that uh, in contrast to uh, uh, David and, and some of the others on this panel, uh, I am not a chess maven at all. Uh, I've been following the history of chess playing machines casually as an AI scientist, and I'd like to address my remarks tonight as an AI scientist, but don't ask me any questions about chess. <laughs> um, I, the first comment, I, I just want to make three comments in my short remark. The first is that uh, I was around, in, and uh, Monty has promised to ask me questions about this, uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, which was then, incidentally, Carnegie Institute of Technology. What, uh, when uh, Newell and Simon and their colleague at Rand Corporation, uh, Cliff Shaw, uh, decided to pick uh, chess as one of the uh, domains of work in which they were going to explore new ideas in thinking machines. It wasn't the only one. They, did, they started out with uh, proving theorems in propositional calculus, and they did other things as well. But chess was a major focus. And they did it because they thought that it was a route that would lead them to understand human problem solving better, because it was a, uh, thought to be an uh, extremely challenging problem for human problem solvers. And they weren't the first who thought that. Of course, we know that uh, we know a, Turing wrote about this in the late 40s, early 50s, but he also talked to others in Britain about this earlier, and he himself thought that. And so did Shannon. Shannon wasn't mentioned in, uh, in the rundown of Shannon. people, but he, he was important in all of this, and, and uh, other people at Los Alamos uh, uh, the, worked on this uh, effort. So, these people were great visionaries, and they took the problem of chess playing seriously. And I think uh, that it's really worthy of our attention, and, it, and it's uh, uh, worthy of the uh, first of these great exhibitions at the uh, Computer History Museum. They were wrong on the time scale. 57, Simon gave a talk in which he predicted that a machine would beat the world's chess champion in 10 years. And he was wrong by 30. Uh, he was, it, was, it was a 40-year history, not a 10-year history. But that's the way it is with AI. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really happy. Uh, the, the problem is that it was the, this feat was achieved by a technique that we all thought was basically impossible. Uh, so it, it serves as an, what you might, if you're one kind of scientist, you would think of it as an outlier point in the space of achievements of artificial intelligence. If you're another kind of scientist, you'd say it's really a challenge to the fundamental hypothesis that AI has been living with, growing up with uh, over the last uh, 50 years. It's about to celebrate its 50th birthday. Uh, and that is, uh, it, let me try to sketch that by, by starting at the bottom. Problem, problem solving is viewed by AI scientists as search in a maze. The mazes are enormous. Uh, some people have, not me, I haven't checked this myself, but some people have estimated that the size of the chess maze is 10 to the 120th pass. And that's relatively small compared to what you might call real world problems. So the size of the, ch the problem space those are called problem spaces, is enormous. And that any kind of uh, what you might call brute force search, although it ended up in, in the uh, famous chess playing programs of being not totally brute force, but uh, 
that brute force search was fruitless. Uh, that the uh, you couldn't you, the no conceivable computer could could search out uh, the solutions to problems in in the time remaining in the universe, or even store intermediate results in all the in all the uh, matter that existed in the uh, universe. So. Uh, of course, we invented another way, and that was the use of knowledge. That wasn't an immediate, in, that wasn't an invention that came later, because, I mean, I was there at Carnegie Tech when Herb Simon, I mean, Al Newell was doing one hell of a lot of programming with Cliff Shaw at the other end of the teletype line at the Rand Corporation, but Herb Simon was reading lots of chess books. I mean, he was really becoming, he, you know, he, he never became a David Levy in terms of quality of chess play, but he, he really got to know chess very well. Uh, and uh, Alex Bernstein, who worked at IBM, was himself uh, uh, an expert at chess. So the idea of applying knowledge to the chess space, problem space was not a new I idea. Uh, and it became the standard idea in artificial intelligence. It, uh, uh, these experiments that Monty was referring to before the, with the Dendral program for uh, uh, hypothesizing organic molecules from uh, mass spectral data, uh, we actually ran what you might call titration experiments in which we ran search versus knowledge. We kept adding, titrating in more and more knowledge of chemistry and watching the search be reduced and watching the quality of the, of the uh, problem solutions improve. And we published all of that. So AI people began to talk about what's called the, the knowledge versus search spectrum. And almost all the points on the knowledge search spectrum ended up on the knowledge side, not on the search side. So it was really remarkable when in the 90s, the developments that you've heard of uh, began to produce world-class problem solvers in a problem that the early and great visionaries that I referred to early, uh, in my, early on in my remarks had thought were, that was such a uh, quintessential, wonderful problem. You apply factors of, let's say, 10 to the seventh more computation than you had before. Why that has any impact on a problem space that's 10 to the 120th big? What's 10 to the seventh? That's nothing. You'd think that knowledge would win. But, um, and, and also people process information very slowly and they are extremely good chess players even though computer programs now beat them. Uh, anyway, I think that we still have a lot to learn from chess playing as a uh, domain of inquiry, uh, I, we have now, when I said one data point, I meant chess playing, but actually that's a mistake. There are dozens, hundreds of these different chess playing programs that we need to analyze carefully from the point of view of knowledge versus search and try to understand uh, why the search strategy paid off. Okay, final comment uh, it has to do with uh, combinatorics and creativity. I've been over this territory numerous times with my uh, former colleagues working on the Dendral Project, uh, Joshua Lederberg, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in medicine who collaborated on the Dendral Project and Bruce Buchanan. Um, the Dendral Project was one of these vast combinatorial, uh, excuse me, the Dendral uh, problem solver was uh, uh, faced with a, one of these vast combinatorial problem spaces and it used knowledge in uh, organic chemistry and mass spectrometry and NMR spectroscopy to narrow that problem space to home in on correct uh, answers. Uh, and so we've discussed often uh, the, the question of what could lurk in those problem spaces? Could there lurk some uh, unique or very surprising, quote, creative, unquote, uh, solution to some problem. After all, the problem space is so vast that you can't see it. So as you search, if you have the right heuristics, will you come upon some really uh, creative solution to some problem? And is that really the answer to, to what is creativity? In 1956, when Newland Simon first started to prove theorems in Whitehead and Russell, there was one uh, theorem in, in chapter two, which was a, 
a longish theorem. It took about two pages for Whitehead and Russell to prove. And I think that the uh, logic theorists proved it in something like two or three lines. And Simon wrote this up and wrote a, sent, it, sent a letter to Bertrand Russell. It's, it's all discussed in Simon's autobiography. Uh, but you might say, how was it possible for a program in 1956 on those primitive early machines of you know, eight, 4K memory or 8K memory to come up with anything, quote, creative, unquote, like that? It was just finding it in a space. So with that in mind, I was very much struck by the remarks that Kasparov made, both uh, written and uh, interview remarks after the game that he lost, where he talked, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the quotes in mind exactly, but there was one, uh, Kirsten could quote them accurately. Uh, one, he talked about uh, something like he got into this, he thought he was looking into the mind of God. And, uh, you know, that's not literally true, but he was spooked. And he even said he was spooked. He said that uh, there was a move in one of the games that really got him jittery and he, he uh, well, David, you can tell the story better than I can. But anyway, uh, what's that all about? What that's all about is these huge combinatorial spaces. And humans can see so little of it. And there are numerous avenues in those spaces where you can find something truly novel, truly surprising. And that's what we call creative. Thanks very much. Our third speaker is Murray Campbell, and I'm excited to hear what he says. Uh, he told me just before we came up on stage that he's going to talk about learning, and I think learning in the context of Deep Blue. Sure. And I'm out to hear and learn something myself. So uh, as someone who spent a lot of years of my life uh, trying to get a program to play better chess than it did, the one thing that I, I regret most is that Deep Blue did not have an ability, an effective ability to, to learn. And in fact, the entire machine and program was designed and programmed and tuned by hand by myself and uh, my colleagues, uh, Feng Sheng Xu and, and Joe Hone. And I, I can't tell you how many times I sat down with, with Grandmaster Joel Benjamin, who was working with us on the project, and he would s try and explain something he, that he thought Deep Blue was doing wrong, and try and explain what the right idea was, and, and he would not be able to put it in operational terms, in terms that I could program. He would say, well, it's just, this attack is winning. You know, it's obvious. And, <laughs> These, this knowledge bottleneck, getting the information out of the, the human experts, I'm sure Ed has had to deal with that for, for years and years, but it was very frustrating. And if only Deep Blue had been able to learn um, by itself, rather than having to be programmed every step of the way, uh, life would have been much easier for me. Um, not to say that there hasn't, hasn't been uh, some great successes in machine learning uh, with respect to game playing. Uh, for example, uh, Jerry Tesoro at IBM developed a backgammon program that played uh, world-class backgammon after training itself by playing games against itself, training a neural network. So it, it's clear that it can be done in some domains, but in my opinion, there haven't been any great successes in learning in chess, uh, either because they've been very narrow attempts or uh, they've been things that just don't scale very well. Let me give one example. Uh, a common attempt to, to learn in chess is to do what's called tuning the evaluation function. The evaluation function recognizes patterns in a chess position and assigns weights or values to them, and then composes those values to create a, a numeric evaluation of the overall chess position so that you can compare positions and make your choice which is the best position. And 
this is an important part of a chess program, but it's in some sense the last thing you do. You've had to build the entire structure. You have to decide what the patterns are that are relevant for uh, a program to know in order to play good chess. And on, in what contexts are those patterns relevant and how they, they change depending on the context. And then, of course, we get to the, the value that they are assigned. And there's even other important parts of learning in, in a pro chess program. For example, the search. Uh, learning where to spend, to, where to focus your efforts on this, maybe focus your efforts on a certain part of the possibilities and, and focus less on others. So it's clear that there are lots of other kinds of, of learning that have been given relatively little attention. I would suggest that a, a, an interesting challenge would be to create a, a program that played chess by learning basically from the same inputs that a human player learns from. A human player has a, a few typical ways of learning. They learn from a teacher who will give them carefully chosen examples that are meant to illustrate a point uh, that hopefully can be generalized. They, they learn from books. They learn from observing other players as they play. And of course, they learn by playing games themselves. So if one could build a system that just using the same inputs as a human could reach very high level chess, I think that would be well beyond the current state of the art, that's for sure. And I think it would be nice because it takes advantage of the, f the, the things that drew the early AI researchers to chess in the first place, which is that chess is a well-defined problem. It has a well-defined set of rules and goals. It has a, a rating scale, so you can easily measure your progress. And it has a huge pool of human experts out there who are willing to give you input and provide opponents and, and help uh, evaluate what you're doing. And of course, chess is, is far too difficult to actually solve uh, in, in any reasonable way. So to summarize, I would say that a machine that could learn chess in the same way that people learn chess would be uh, an interesting challenge for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've, we've waited for a while to hear the words from the father of artificial intelligence himself. And I'm excited to hear what John has to say in this regard. John, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> My usual habit. Uh, <clears throat> I have only moderate excuse to speak about chess programming, which is to say I started to write one, and then I got some students to take it over. <laughs> uh, and uh, this was the program for the IBM 704 that uh, uh, played using an IBM 7090, the match with the Soviets. And they had a better program, a worse computer, but a better program. Uh, and uh, when they described it to me in 1965, I already knew that it was going to be, that it was better, because it had some ideas that I hoped to put in, but had not succeeded in, um, in, uh, in getting the students to do it. Um, okay, now I, I think I want to be a bit technical in this, and I want to be a, a bit historical, but I'll start the history quite, uh, quite a bit earlier. <coughs> now, um, the first uh, uh, evaluation functions have been mentioned, but evaluation functions came along long before there were computers uh, playing chess. Uh, in particular, almost any chess book will tell you uh, simple statements like uh, 
a queen is worth nine and a rook is worth five, and some others will say, well, a queen is worth 10 and a rook is worth five, and a pawn, but they all say a pawn is worth one and so forth. So all of the, uh, any, uh, anybody that teaches you how to play chess will tell you something about the evaluation function. Now the guy who, uh, the pre-computer guy who did the most with evaluations was uh, uh, Aaron Nimzowicz, um, who wrote a book called My System, which was heavily based on uh, an evaluation function that he devised that took not merely material, but also uh, positional aspects uh, uh, into account. And uh, Alex Bernstein, who was the first person to write a program for the full board, um, decided to adopt, insofar as he could, Nimzowicz's um, uh, evaluation function. So we really did have uh, the mathematization of chess uh, to a certain extent, a long before computers came along. Now, um, there was, uh, however, uh, the mathematization of chess, pre-computer mathematization of chess, uh, as far as I know, didn't discuss at all the um, process of search. That is, of course, they, uh, everybody agreed there was a process of search. Uh, but uh, nobody had anything very specific to say about it. Now, the first proposals for chess programs and the very first chess programs uh, used Minimax, uh, in which they um, calculated all the moves, or in some cases, just some of the moves that were promising and all the replies, or the promising replies, and so forth, and um, carried out this, uh, formed this tree of moves as far as was computationally feasible for the computer of that time. In uh, Bernstein's case, um, it was seven by seven by seven by seven. Um, so he, got a, he examined about 2,500 N positions. The, uh, the Los Alamos program also used uh, Minimax. And uh, Turing's hand simulation uh, used Minimax. Uh, now, uh, the first advance over that was the Alpha Beta, uh, which said, well, you don't really have to evaluate all the positions. Uh, because uh, if you move and the opponent can refute it, uh, then you don't have to look for other refutations once you've found one. That's a bit of an oversimplified uh, description, uh, description of alpha beta. But it ex it, it, um, in, when it works well, and it requires good move ordering to work well, uh, it reduces the number of positions that have to be examined to the square root of the number of that have to be examined otherwise. Uh, so if you have, um, uh, if you're going to look at um, 100 million positions in, uh, with Minimax, uh, then you could hope to uh, look at only 10,000 positions uh, using alpha beta. Now, um, I think, um, uh, it is mistaken in that there haven't been um, heuristic advances in computer chess over the o over these years, and uh, uh, Murray has uh, has talked about some of them. Now, uh, why does what uh, so? But nevertheless, uh, brute force, as it's called, using some heuristic uh, heuristics has uh, beaten uh, human chess, and human chess is more sophisticated. So why is that true? And I think it's true because chess is peculiar. Uh, namely, the amount of branching in chess is rather moderate, so that you can follow out the branching. If there were a lot more uh, branching, 
<laughs> then uh, the, the chest brute force wouldn't work. And in particular, the programs for playing the Japanese game of Go, which have had a lot of work put into them, are far worse than chess programs, uh, partly because of the greater amount of branching. Um, now, um, the question has to do with what, um, uh, now I think alpha beta is compulsory. Now different people invented, uh, invented aspects of alpha beta at different times. Uh, uh, it uses my nomenclature, that is I called it alpha beta in, in my invention of it, but um, I didn't get it quite right. Um, and uh, the first uh, comparison of it with Minimax where it was shown to be uh, definitely uh, uh, better than Minimax was with uh, Mike Levin and Tim Hart around 1960, uh, and then into quite independently of that, a Russian by the name of Alexander Brudneau um, invented Alpha Beta and, and wrote a really proper uh, scientific paper on the subject. Uh, but my claim is that Alpha Beta is compulsory um, for uh, chess programs, and uh, all the programs since, I don't know when, 1960 have, uh, or maybe the middle 50s have used it. Uh, and, but yet, it's not totally obvious because really some very good people uh, who thought about chess programs, Shannon for example, uh, did, not, um, did not think of it, although a lot of people who did build chess programs independently did think of it, so it's, um, uh, it's not a unique idea, but it's uh, a good one. Now, um, when I first visited the Soviet Union in 1965 and got challenged to play uh, the Soviet uh, 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 program, uh, the head of the group that was doing the programming was named Alexander Kronrod, um, uh, offered the slogan, the chess is the Drosophila of artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, to some extent, Cronrod's slogan is correct, but also to a large extent it is not. Uh, it is not correct. Uh, it certainly isn't a Drosophila for all of artificial intelligence, but then the Drosophila isn't the Drosophila for all of genetics. Uh, uh, but, um, it does have the peculiarity that it doesn't branch uh, too much. Now, um, the question of looking at the move tree as a whole, uh, it seems to me that this has been experimented with adequately by Ken Thompson, uh, who showed that uh, you could make a program would, which would um, construct tables of position versus the right move in the position for chess positions that had uh, up to five pieces. Uh, and that's the, uh, now if, of course, faster machines would um, improve and uh, with bigger memory would improve that a little bit, but you're not gonna get uh, anywhere near the 32 pieces of uh, actual chess, even if you had the, go the whole galaxy uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be your memory. So I think uh, Thompson says we need, uh, uh, shows us that we need um, something else. You know, chess has the property that uh, a look ahead to a certain depth with alpha beta and with a good evaluation function uh, and a little and some other things that enable you to follow the most promising lines further uh, is something that will allow a computer that is very very fast to beat the world champion. Now I'd like to see a chess uh, computer chess tournament um, 
running in the opposite direction. Namely, that has extreme limitations on the amount of computation that the program could do. Uh, namely, uh, with current uh, PCs, uh, maybe one millisecond uh, of uh, computation uh, should be allowed. Now, my contention is that uh, eventually people would make machines that do one millisecond of computation and can beat almost all human players, even, perhaps even the champions, I don't really know that, but they're going to have to be clever. And uh, that will serve as more of a Drosophila for AI uh, than uh, uh, a contest on who can make the fastest, who can get hold of the fastest, uh, uh, the fastest uh, computing equipment. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I have. Um I have two questions for the panel, and then we'll open it for the audience to ask questions. Uh, actually, the first one is really directed to David Levy, although I think everybody can maybe have their say on it. Uh, we're here to celebrate the fact that Deep Blue beat Kasparov. If, if Deep Blue hadn't beaten Kasparov, we'd be sitting waiting for somebody else or maybe Deep Blue to beat Kasparov in a couple of years. Uh, the Deep Blue beat Kasparov, and it's not clear that he beat Kasparov if you talk to Kasparov. It's clear that Kasparov lost to Deep Blue, but it's not clear exactly what happened. Uh, we're now almost a decade later, and we can take a look back and maybe try and digest whether it was a legitimate defeat. And I would like to ask David Levy the question, was, was it a legitimate victory by Deep Blue? And maybe somebody else on the panel has something to say. Maybe Murray. <laughs> well, I think that um, it was most definitely a, a genuine um, victory. Um, the sporting result was that Deep Blue scored three and a half points and Kasparov scored two and a half. Uh, what actually happened is that um, in the first game of the match, Kasparov won. In the second game, he lost. But the way he lost was something that he couldn't comprehend because he was expecting to play a program that was a bit improved on the program he'd played a year earlier in Philadelphia. And instead, he played a program that was much improved. But that wasn't the only thing because in the second game of the match, the program played the Rai Lopez opening against Kasparov, which is probably the best known opening in chess literature. And the Rai Lopez is characterized, particularly the variation they played, characterized by very slow, subtle maneuvering with long-term strategy being the most important factor in deciding what moves to make. Things happen extremely slowly and some of the games are very long with this opening. And in positions like that, everyone knows or everyone knew, computers just can't play those positions because they require long-term strategy. And yet Kasparov was sitting there and move after move after move after move, Deep Blue found a really strong strategic move, the basis of which was in a long-term strategy. And slowly but surely, Kasparov's position got worse and worse and worse. And I hate to think what was going on in his mind because he was witnessing something that before the game started he didn't believe was possible. And as a result of that game, w w which he lost, his psyche was completely destroyed. There were some other extraneous factors that caused him to worry un unfoundedly. But what really happened was that his psyche was destroyed by seeing a program play in a way that he never believed possible. And certainly, it was a very, very far cry away from the Deep Blue he played the year before. And in a six-game match, if your psyche is destroyed in game two, you're not going to play at your best after that. And although he tried very hard in games three, four, and five, he was unable to make more than a draw in any of those games. 
And after five games, he was totally mentally drained. He was psychologically destroyed. And so game six, when he came to game six, he, he wasn't really in a fit mental state to play because the program had already destroyed him. And that is perfectly legitimate. If you're playing a match at chess against a strong opponent, you want to win by scoring more points than them, by destroying their psyche, by outplaying them, by playing in ways that they're not expecting. All of these methods are perfectly legitimate. So yes, Monty, I think it was a serious and genuine victory. Thank you, David. Would anybody else? Yeah. Two remarks. Uh, destroying his psyche reminds me of Bobby Fischer, who, um, who wanted to do that. The second remark is that even if Kasparov had won that match, I believe the computer museum would still have managed to hold this me meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Murray would like to say something. I just wanted to add that um, during game two, uh, we were all smiles during that game because we were thinking back about a year earlier, sometime in the, uh, the summer of, of 1996, when a certain set of positions had arisen on the chessboard as, during our training, and we, we decided to add a particular feature to the evaluation function, which came into play and, and made a huge difference in that particular game. And so we realized as that game progressed that this feature, uh, which was related to when to open up the position and when to keep it closed, but keep the option of opening it up, we could see that this was putting a lot of pressure on, and, and on Kasparov. And whether or not we won the game, we were very pleased to see all that hard work from a year earlier come to fruition in, in that particular game. Thank you, Mary. So I think it's fair to conclude, and I hear, haven't heard anything too terribly contradictory, that Deep Blue's victory was a legitimate victory, and that John says we would be here anyways, but it certainly increased the probability by having Deep Blue win the match. And <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Murray one more time. I've congratulated him many times. I think, I think it's, it's appropriate to open up uh, for questioning from the audience. Okay, yeah, well, people were mentioning alpha beta. I just wanted to, to mention, I, I wrote this paper giving a mathematical analysis of alpha beta, and, and uh, a month later, I got a, uh, in the uh, on, on my desk at Stanford w was a box of prunes, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I couldn't think who have I offended by this, and and uh, you know because we call it pruning, uh, the alpha beta is the pruning thing. Well, 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 but then I looked at the box a little closer, and here it had been purchased in the East Bay at an alpha beta market. <laughs> so, so I received this box of alpha beta prunes. Okay. Um, now, but the the uh, the question I had for for the panel is, if you'd like to comment, uh, I think programs that play chess are a lot different from most computer programs in one respect. That is, if you take most computer programs and if you uh, sort of at random uh, uh, clobber uh, several instructions in the program, uh, then the program dies. Uh, but you take a, a program that plays chess and you, and, and you, and you sort of randomly change pro uh, instructions, uh, you know, plus to a minus or something like this, uh, it just gets slightly weaker. And, and I'd like to, you know, them to comment about that. I, I've certainly ob observed that. Uh, you can't imagine the, the, the program's been playing for weeks or months and we discover the most horrible bug that we can't imagine how the program could have been playing, but it was. And uh, it's just, it's searching through so many possibilities and, and is so robust that it, it just somehow makes its way through those bugs, which makes it harder to find the bugs in the first place, of course. I'd like to add something to that. Um, uh, one of the bugs that Arthur Samuel found after some trouble in his program that it had the sign of the evaluation function backwards. 
uh, and yet it seemed to play pretty well. <laughs> and uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason for that is that if you want to, uh, there is a form of chess in which you want, uh, a variant of chess in which you want to lose, in which you want your king to be checkmated. And the correct way to play that is to play as if you wanted to win until the last minute, and then start throwing the opponent your, your pieces. So there's a concept which has never been really described by anyone, uh, which is the question of a powerful position that uh, enables you in a powerful position to, to achieve whatever you want. Uh, and uh, uh, Samuel's program uh, looked ahead quite a long ways and uh, given the backwards evaluation function it wanted to have as low a uh, score as possible. And it turns out that the right way after, to have a low score after 10 moves um, is something like to play as though you wanted to have a high score for seven moves and then start throwing things away. <laughs> okay. The next question, please. Uh, Steve Squires. I was really struck by the um, realism uh, expressed by the panel and their, their extraordinary ability to, to celebrate 40 years towards solving this incredibly hard problem and then coming up with yet new problems to solve. And I'm, I'm really serious about this because I remember when Tool and I were at DARPA and, and uh, a call came in from the director's office saying, did you know that there was a Skunk Works unapproved project at CMU that was using lots of um, Moses design cycles to produce some chips for this computer play chess. Um, what do you think? And we said, yeah, we know about it. What's wrong with it? And they said, well, it's not an approved program. We said, well, actually it is. It's a skunk works. That's the way it's supposed to work. Okay. <laughs> they didn't bother us. Now, when the New York Times asked for an official interview with me, I said, um, I really wasn't aware of it. It really didn't matter. Um, <laughs> but if it was going on at CMU and they thought they were learning, it was good enough for me. <laughs> now for a more serious, so, so, so you, the, one, one of the things that impressed me was your candor in saying the system was not learning. It took 40 years of extraordinary computer science, AI, luck, hacking, wizardry to get to this point and then you set the new challenge of we'd like it to learn in the ordinary way and then John McCarthy who got us all into this trouble <laughs> said yeah but, but without such a large computer. <laughs> with a computer which is about only as fast as this rather error-prone rotten thing that's between my ears or anybody's ears. But I have a question for McCarthy. Would you allow some number of, say, idealized qubits to be in this computer? And if so, now an idealized qubit means that a qubit which really works assuming that, that the error, error problem has been solved, just to reduce it. So, what is your estimate for, take the parameters you gave for the processing speed of this thing, or your thing, which is way better than my thing, and um, how many qubits do you think it would take to, to first redo it as well as Deep Blue, Deep Thought did it, and second, you know, how many qubits would it take and how hard would it be and what time frame to get to the point where it would learn? Tough Just as a, I thought I'd give you, you know, 10, 20 years, bet you a thousand dollars, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, $1,024. Okay. Well, um, I attended a course of lectures in quantum computing uh, a few years ago and uh, learned about as much as I'm capable of learning at my age. Uh, but anyway, uh, quantum computing is still substantially a mystery. So it's known that it can do factoring. It's known that it can't do NP complete problems. Uh, I don't know how it's known that it can't. Uh, so I don't know how, how uh, quantum computing could be made to do with uh, chess. Uh, I know, uh, or at least I believe, that with the present knowledge of quantum computing, even if you could make a com quantum computing 
uh, nobody would know how to make a chess program that was a lot better than uh, non-quantum chess programs, but some clever person, as clever as Peter Shore, um, might very well uh, uh, succeed um, uh, succeed in doing that. Can Ed, would you like to make yeah, a comment? Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, take off on a different angle from Steve's uh, question to John, not on quantum computing, uh, about which I know very little, but I, <coughs> I do want to uh, discuss this issue that uh, John McCarthy raised about uh, limiting the amount of computing that is posing as a challenge to uh, AI scientists uh, a game in which you would limit the amount of computing available. Now, if you go back to the very beginning of the modern history of AI, in fact, if you, one good way to look at this is to look at the sections of uh, the book that I think Monty referred to before, the com book Computers and Thought, which was a, an anthology put together in 1962. And uh, they're about even, evenly divided between two halves of AI, artificial intelligence, which is sort of the uh, I don't care how we do it as long as we do it well, part, versus simulation of human cognition, which is uh, I'm aiming for the for uh, verisimilitude, ver uh, testability versus human data in information processing models of human thought. John, in his suggestion, I think was uh, saying if we do that, we will stimulate more thinking along the lines of simulating how inadequate computation, how clever inadequate computation needs to be in order to work at all, which is what we were trying to do in the early days in simulation of human cognition. I'd like to uh, recall, though, that, uh, that what I, I think I mentioned it in my remarks, uh, one of the goals of AI, the engineering side of AI in 1956 and 60 and so on, was uh, ultra-intelligent computing. That is, we were, some, some of us were interested in psychology, like Herb Simon and Al Newell and even my early work and, and uh, Don Norman's in the audience, uh, his work and, and others. But others wanted just to build programs which were as smart as could possibly be. And what I'd like to understand now from the, uh, what you might call the the victory of big computation over uh, human computation in chess, I'd like to understand what are the bounds of that? What happened there? Why, if, if chess is a good area in which that can be accomplished, then I'd like to know just why. How can I pick other problems that will be just like that, where I can beat the hell out of human performance uh, <laughs> with high-speed computation? And I don't think we understand that now. I mean, John said it. Did you say it was a sort of an accident, or that that no, chess was peculiar, peculiar in chess? And we don't understand uh, why. Uh, uh, we, we understand if, if we understood it scientifically, we could find other problems that fit. Uh, I want to tell one DARPA story. Uh, <clears throat> I have a student named Dave Wilkins, who wrote a thesis um, on um, recognizing patterns for sharp positions in the middle game in chess. And um, I was talking to the DARPA program manager and justifying it and saying, well, pattern recognition here uh, would be useful for pattern recognition in other problems besides chess. And he said, well, he was a military officer. He said, well, all right. But when he publishes his work of his thesis, would he kindly not acknowledge our support? <laughs> <laughs> That's an unusual one. Uh, we have a, a number of people that want to ask questions, and I'm, I'm torn between listening to the responses to the questions and hearing what the questions are going to be. Can I possibly ask the people that are going to ask the questions to be very brief? And if we can have, I don't know how we get brief answers from our panelists, but, <laughs> but the Either that or we're going to have to cut it short. So let's try another couple of questions and see how it works out. Uh, Michael Deering, and my brief question got linked in by the last two questions. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, 
McCarthy, uh, when he s uh, said, let's have a millisecond of time, said limited computation, but I didn't, I heard a time limit, but I didn't hear a space limit. I mean, our brains, you know, process slowly, but, you know, we got a lot of uh, neurons there. So is there a limit on how many petatransistors I'm allowed to employ during that uh, millisecond per move? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, how active the human brain is is still uh, something which is unknown. Uh, what is known, for example, rec only recently, is that when someone is doing uh, mental arithmetic, uh, a certain small part of the brain uh, starts using much more um, energy. And uh, what this says to me, or what this suggests to me, in accordance with my previous prejudices, um, is that most of the time, most of the brain is inactive. Uh, and that means that uh, comparisons of computing uh, with the brain based on counting the number of neurons in the brain uh, are, are not sound. I'm sorry, did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been looking at the fMRI uh, data. Uh, no, the question was, if you're going to limit on computation, was you put whatever limit on space you want. It doesn't have to be all the neurons of the brain, but with everything now being parallel processors and custom chips and programmable gate arrays and so forth, there's, I mean, many, many orders of magnitude difference between what one serial Pentium can do and what I can do on a couple of boards of uh, programmable chips. So if you're serious about a millisecond challenge, I'd like there to be a space uh, uh, limitation as well. Please. Uh, Kasparov would argue, and I would argue, that it wasn't a fair contest between IBM and Kasparov because Kasparov could not see what the machine's tendencies were, how it played. There was no history. So Kasparov was at an immense psychological disadvantage before it even started. At the grandmaster level, you study your opponents. You know what they do. You want to put them into a discomfort zone, and you want to keep them from putting you into a discomfort zone, and you couldn't do that. And I believe Kasparov wanted to get some trace of how the machine played and do it again, and IBM wouldn't do it. So I don't think it was a fair contest. My quite, I mean, Kasparov lost, but, but IBM did have this immense psychological advantage. My question is, why are chess playing programs so good and contract bridge playing programs by comparison simply not comparable? I just wanted to have one comment on, uh, uh, on the, first, the first point. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kasparov indeed had a large body of games and history to him that other grandmasters know about and take advantage of. Uh, when we were building Deep Blue and programming it, we didn't pay attention to any of it. We programmed the machine as a chess player and not a Kasparov player. Um, so in that sense, Deep Blue no knew nothing about Kasparov. It only knew about chess. Um, so as for the, uh, the other question, bridge, I think there's a number of games where uh, there are, it's not in the sweet spot where, of, of where search and knowledge are, are just right and alpha beta is the perfect solution. Bridge with its the randomness and, and hidden information, uh, it certainly makes it more difficult. Poker uh, is another example of a game where uh, computers are are good but not world class yet. And of course, Go is is the the best known example of a game where computers are far from world class. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kasparov's point, though, was that he was at a disadvantage. I'm not saying that, that Deep Blue was not a Kasparov machine, but in Kasparov's normal preparation, what he expected, he should have known, or he felt he should have known some of the yeah. tendencies. 
Thank you, Murray. Next question. Um, Ren Wu, um, in my spare time, I also do um, computer Chinese chess, so it's a little bit different. Um, so I learned from the history of the uh, computer chess a lot. But I would like to ask panel members, um, in one sentence, summarize the single most things you learn through the computer chess history. Thank you. Somebody would like to take a shot? One sentence. One sentence. What you've learned the most from? The most single important thing. Single important thing you learned through the history. So basically Good summarize question. what you Good question. You what, what have we learned from computer chess? David, in one sentence. I think we've learned that problems normally requiring human intelligence for their solution can be solved by computers without using any intelligent techniques. That's great. John, can you top that? <laughs> yeah, some problems. Um, now, to tell you the truth, not having studied carefully computer chess, I have the feeling that a lot has been learned that has uh, more technical than I am, uh, ha have been able to follow. Uh, so for example, uh, what has been published about uh, Deep Blue is something that I, uh, is quite technical, but I haven't managed to read it. Would, would one of the other, Ed, would you like to make a comment? What have we learned? Yeah, my sentence would be, uh, it is remarkable to the point of being almost unbelievable that there is one outlier point on the knowledge search spectrum called chess playing programs when all the other data points that we have about excellence in AI program behavior lie at the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> well, checkers also. Checkers is almost solved at this point. Correct. It's not solved yet. Correct, two points. <laughs> <laughs> the Murray, who's, the, who's spent the most time recently batting his, batting his brains around on this right. problem, what have we learned? I couldn't say it better than David. I think he's, he's pointed out that there are uh, some problems that it's better to throw computation at than and try and be too clever. That's great, thank you very much. John, let me, let me ask you, what do you think is reasonable on our time schedule here? Can we take another 15, 20 minutes of questions? Okay, we'll take another 15 or 20 minutes of questions. Would you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Ellen Ullman. Uh, this is a good follow-on to what you just talked about uh, because uh, uh, both Murray Campbell and, and you, John McCarthy, seem to be calling for methods that were more analogous to the way human intelligence works. I mean, it seems to me that AI has, up until now, worked at appearing intelligent but inside having processes that are not analogous to the way humans think. And so, this goes along with your question of the Drosophila of AI. Um, and perhaps chess is not a good Drosophila. I'd like to ask, uh, will a computer be able to uh, complete the New York Times Saturday crossword puzzle more quickly than a human being? And I mean this seriously. Would anybody well, like to answer that? Uh, I'm going to answer that. John? When they can do it at all, they'll be able to do it more quickly. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I guess my point is that now, language, language is, is a, is a To what extent, uh, uh, I, I must say that I, in my views, I'm eccentric. <laughs> and uh, one of the areas in which I'm eccentric has to do with computers and language. Uh, and the work over the last 50 years on computers and language has concentrated on syntax. And uh, my opinion is that the more important thing about language is the semantics, the meaning of things. Uh, to take a, a trivial example, suppose uh, 
you uh, want to translate into French and Russian. The sentence, uh, I went to Moscow. Uh, you can translate it trivially in, into French. Je suis allé à Moscou, barring pronunciation. Uh, <laughs> if you want to translate it in Russian, then what you have to know is whether the speaker is male or female, uh, and also whether the Moscow is a place that you would normally walk to or a place that you would normally travel to uh, uh, in a vehicle. They would use uh, uh, different words uh, for translating went. Uh, 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 so there are four cases, this, this one English word which translates into one French combination would translate according to this other information into four different things uh, in Russian. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, maybe the linguists haven't ignored this, this specific problem but uh, they've ignored a lot about, uh, uh, about the semantics of language. And I think to really do crossword puzzles, uh, perhaps the semantics of language comes in. Uh, I guess my point is that, um, that language is so uh, central to human intelligence that um, it's hard to imagine a Drosophila of AI that does not include uh, a, a deep understanding of semantics. I mean, crossword puzzles are extremely difficult because they challenge you to think of s so many ways that a single word can be used. And there are puns, there are jokes, there are, there are missing things, there are, there are patterns. Uh, it, it goes to every, every part of uh, intelligence vis-a-vis uh, -vis language. I should just mention, I think there's, there's already a uh, grand ch challenge that's very language oriented, and that's just the Turing test. As, as uh, imperfect as it is, it's still a, uh, something that has not yet been achieved that requires very good language skills. I, I just got to say that I disagree with that whole line of reasoning. It's, it, it, it's so often said, and uh, there's no, no real substantial basis for saying it. For example, uh, if we take Einstein, if Einstein was in some way uh, uh, language disabled, and he couldn't really, you know, like he, he spoke some very weird uh, Mongolian language that no one could understand, except some graduate student who would translate, uh, would we, uh, would we still say that he, he was not intelligent? Or su suppose that he, he spoke only physics language and not regular human language. Uh, so it, it's a, I don't know, it's a, it, it's, it's a very uh, linguistics-centric view that says that language plays such a central role in all of this, or at least human language. I think we need a whole swarm of flies. Uh, <laughs> chess, chess is just being just one of them. But I, the language thing, I think, is worth, worthy of another panel here, John, yeah. uh, so that <laughs> somebody from the audience could make a bet with some computational linguist up here on stage. <laughs> <laughs> for, like, for example, we, I, the one that was just posed about the New York Times crossword puzzle and so on, uh, I can imagine someone with enthusiasm who doesn't really care much about his pocketbook would say, <laughs> would say 15 years we could do it. And then, you know, it really happened in 50 or something like that. Um, but that's worthy of another panel. Boy, I'm torn to say something myself at this point. The, um, the animal world is an is a interesting duel to keep your eye on when we're studying intelligence. And while we've talked about human intelligence and machine intelligence, animal intelligence is quite, quite an interesting aspect. And I, uh, there's a book around, if, I, if a lion could talk, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but the, the, what a lion would say is intelligent might be quite different from what a human being might say is intelligent. And uh, I think we look at things as intelligent from a human standpoint, and it's not clear if that's the exclusive way to look at things. This is a very exciting debate going on here. Um, 
one of the things that as a professor for many years, I've been to many lectures and the, the, the speakers will give a talk for an hour and at the end he'll, he'll ask for questions and the audience will sit there stone-faced. Nobody will say anything and everybody walks home. But if you talk about chess, computers, and intelligence, it heats up. So we, next question. Hello, my name is uh, Kat Powell. I'm a volunteer uh, greeter docent here at the Computer History Museum. And uh, I have a question for Ed. Uh, first of all, two questions. The first one is, are you uh, by any chance related to uh, Mitchell Feigenbaum at the Los Alamos, the famous no, but uh, chaos. No. The answer is no, and uh, uh, but the thing, the great thing is, I get credit for two careers. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought maybe you might be his brother or his relative. And and, and then there then there's this Mitchell Feigenbaum envy when you do a Google search on Feigenbaum, and then you show up all these Mitchell Feigenbaum hits, <laughs> and then there's Joan Feigenbaum, who was a student of ours in computer science, who's has more hits than Mitchell or myself, and uh, uh, you know she's no relative of mine either. Okay, my next question is uh, related to artificial intelligence, so it's for you, the AI expert. Um, uh, Tic Tac Toe uh, has a very uh, limited problem space. It's probably one of the smallest problem spaces, and chess has a larger problem space but it still is limited compared to maybe the uh, crossword puzzles that the other lady was speaking about. And so uh, my question for you is uh, concerning uh, AI algorithms. Uh, I'm sorry, and concerning what? AI algorithm. The algorithms you use to solve problems uh, for chess. Uh, do you uh, consider or do you uh, uh, actually look at um, uh, cultural bias when you're uh, using uh, uh, algorithm to solve uh, chess? So I think that breaks up in, uh, it's a very interesting question and it breaks up into two pieces. One is when, when knowledge-based systems program builders, which is the kind of program builder, well I shouldn't say that I am, I, I should say as John did, what we ask our students to do. Uh, uh, does that use knowledge which is culturally biased? And then there's a second question about chess, which is specific to chess, and that's something you're gonna have to ask these two guys. Because uh, I simply don't know the answer. I don't even, I don't know the cultural answer, and I don't know the chess answer to that one. But mm -hmm. on the other one, uh, I would say that uh, in the areas that we have explored most, I, I think the short answer is yes, but it will surprise you what culture. The culture we're talking about is scientific analytic thinking culture. Um, or maybe another way to put it is when uh, C.P. Snow was talking about the, the gap between the two cultures, uh, we're, we're talking about the techies, not the fuzzies, uh, as we refer to them at Stanford. Uh, so, uh, but we're not talking about the cultural difference between, let's say, the Germans and the Americans, or the Americans and the Japanese. Uh, when, you, when you get in, in, in what we, let's say, call Western medicine, you see that applied in Japan. It's just the same as Western medicine applied in the United States. Uh, it's the same scientific analytic culture. Thank you very much. I agree with you, Ed. It's a small point. Can we have the next question, please? Your name? Uh, Eric Miller. Uh, base, basically, the question is, uh, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk about making AIs, AIs smarter, better, and all that. Uh, what about the other way? What about the other way? Making them less, making them work, making an AI that a 1400 player can beat Inst instead of something that can be that that can beat a cast bar, something that a mo that a program that a modern a modern computer with no with no necessary time limits no time limits no uh, search space limitations that a regular 1400 player can beat because the program 
makes mistakes every so often, will hang a piece. <laughs> because there, I have never played a chess program that has ever hang, hung a piece. If I see his piece out there, I'm afraid to take it because I know it's, I know it's, I'm paranoid. So, David, David has uh, developed a number of commercial programs over the years and I think maybe he has the best answer. Uh, I'll tell you a, a, a true story that happened to me in the late 1970s. I was consulting for a small company down south called Texas Instruments trying to um, develop a chess program for a home computer that they were developing. And I wrote the algorithms, I wrote the complete specification, I went to Texas about 11 times over 18 months to advise the team on what to do. And one day I got in there and the guy who was in charge of the project, a very tall Texan, he came into the office with his Stetson hat and his leather boots and he, he was about six foot 10 tall and he put his leather boots on the table and he said, golly gee David, I don't like your program. And I said, why not then? And he said, it beats me every goddamn time. <laughs> so I thought for a moment, and I said, that's a very fair comment, Len. I'll do something about it. <laughs> so I put in a losing mode. And what, what uh, at the, the first level, instead of the, him playing on level one, which was beating him every time, the program's level one was changed so that it would lose, but it would lose very subtly. It would start off by adding a very small random number to every evaluation. And as the game progressed, the size of the random number range increased. So that you actually got the impression that you were playing really well. <laughs> Hang on, that's not, that's not the end. Um, there were one or two rules like, thou shalt not give checkmate, and thou shalt not make a draw. And so we put, the, we put this level in, and the next time I went back, a very strange thing had happened. Len had played against the losing level, and he'd won, naturally, he'd won every game, and that made him very happy. And he was so pleased after he won about a dozen games or so, he moved up to level two, which was the old level one that he lost every game to. And you know what? He started winning one or two games on level two, because he'd got so much confidence from level one. So yes, you're quite right. All chess programs should have levels in for all levels of strengths of chess player. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your name, please. I'm Barney Pell. Hi, guys. Um, when, uh, when I was doing my PhD thesis, uh, kind of a few years after Murray's, and Murray was just getting going with the whole Deep Blue, and I think just after B. Kasparov, um, I asked him a question, which was, if you were to change the rules of chess by just a little bit, so the knights moved over one and up three instead of over one and up two, then what would you have to do to make Deep Blue play that game, or how well would it play? And Marie looked at me and said, we'd just have to start all over. Okay. Well, we'd have to build a brand new machine, because <laughs> it's, it's so brittle that any change like that would, would completely destroy it. Right. And in addition, the evaluation function would be off, and you have to figure out where that would come from, but there wouldn't be any human games to look at. So. It was an interesting challenge. Um, that uh, points to the larger issue, which is that by focusing ruthlessly on just one game, we feel like we've made a lot of progress. But we learn something, and then we try to generalize out. But that kind of ruthless focus, it's possible that all the knowledge and all the power came from humans studying the game and finding just that sweet spot and just that combination. So that when you now go and look at another problem, we really don't know if it'll work or not. So there's an issue of generality. Um, one. Uh, what I worked on for my work was this concept of a general game playing program. And a different Drosophila, which was rather than play chess, make a program that could take in the rules of any game without any human assistance and play that, play that game well. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be able to share that just this year, this is kind of a long time later, there was the first uh, general game playing program competition at the AAAI conference in Pittsburgh. And um, the programs were given rules that the humans had never seen before and they had to struggle and play. It was really difficult. They weren't very good, but a program that had more knowledge in it and sort of better suited to the uh, general strategies of, of games did a better job. So there's a new level of competition coming up, and I think that's really exciting. Very interesting. Thank you. So we have about, we'll take, we'll try and finish the seven questions. So let's. Hi, my name is Dan Miller. I work at Carnegie Mellon. I've been doing some robotic stuff there. Um, so I, I sort of get a, a it's a bit of a dissatisfaction in a sense that, you know, we conquered this problem, but in some way we didn't do it with the elegance or the, 
some je ne sais quoi, pardon my uh, pronunciation. So uh, my question really is for Murray, um, and it's, it's this. To what, obviously, uh, Deep Blue didn't acquire its knowledge in the same way that humans did, but once it had that knowledge base through all the years of programming, the man years, the millions, I assume, lines of code and all the, the chips and everything, do you think, is there really that much of a difference between how it applied that knowledge, or is it just an architectural difference, like it, it had a worse evaluation, but it did more searching, but are, don't humans sort of use a similar sort of database in a sense, and is it really just a different way of accessing the same knowledge base? And then Mike, I'll ask another question later, but or I don't have time. Um, the human approach is, is traditionally assumed to be a, a large database of, of patterns or chunks that uh, are, are recognized, and then the position is recognized relative to those patterns and the essential differences are pulled out and some logical reasoning is done and a small amount of search, a few dozen or a few hundred positions perhaps. So it's very hard to make the comparison with a few billion positions in a search that, in an evaluation that's completed in you know, a millisecond or a microsecond. You're saying it's a qualitative difference, not a quantitative difference. You're quite certain of that. Reasonably certain. I can't say I know enough about what's going on inside our heads to, to, but it seems very likely to me that we're not looking at a billion possibilities when we uh, calculate. Okay, I, I'll, I'll leave, but I just, I keep coming back to the comment that, you know, Kasparov thought he was looking into the mind of God and it just, I'm sensing a dissonance, you know, it's sort of, it's almost like he was fooled, like he would be fooled by a puppet or some sort of artifice or something like that, so. It just confuses I, me. I think uh, one thing you're not really getting is uh, our strong, it's our job to have a strong se sense of dissatisfaction with where we are. Uh, and remember that our goal is something like this. John will have a panel about 100 years from now, and you won't know whether we are automatons or humans. <laughs> All right, this is really quick. I just want to say, um, and Eugene, you might remember the name of this game they play at the Hackers Conference, but you sit down at the table and you don't know any rules. And if anybody can remember the name, it was invented at MIT. It's called like MUM or something. You sit down at the table, you literally don't know the rules, and you tend to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, very interesting. Next question. Uh, my question, I think, would be a good follow-up on, on the previous question, and uh, the question is basically, I think we all agree that it's been a, AI has been a victory of big computation or brute force computation over human-like computation. Or basically, as somebody said, Deep Blue did not at a very fundamental level have the ability to learn. So my, my, my question is that uh, maybe is this the wrong approach to achieving intelligence and wouldn't AI be a misnomer? Uh, or any other possible approaches to intelligence you guys have thought about? John, Murray? It's a tough question. Uh, my question is basically that, we as we know that Deep Blue did not fundamentally have the ability to learn, so this approach to, compu uh, this approach to artificial intelligence that we have, the, the search-based uh, approach, isn't this probably a fundamentally a wrong approach to achieving intelligence? Maybe shouldn't we be looking elsewhere? I would just say I think that whether or not Deep Blue, Blue learned is orthogonal to how it went about solving the problem. And I could easily imagine ways uh, and, and research programs to enable Deep Blue as it is now to, to learn as opposed to having to invent a new system that would be learned. David, would you like to how, see how can we How can we say the approach is wrong when it works? <laughs> I guess my question is, isn't that, uh, okay, have you thought of other ways of achieving intelligence apart from the brute force computational way? Well, there, can was, you point there, me there, was, there was an attempt um, by one of uh, Murray's colleagues at CMU Hans Berliner, to devise a search strategy that worked in exactly the same way that human chess masters think. 
And when I first read about it, which I think was in 1979, I thought, hooray, this is somebody who's actually come with a really intelligent way of searching the game tree. This is bound to work. And I was completely wrong, and so was Hans. It didn't work. Um, and I think one must go back, really, um, to say that if something works, then why fix it? But David is right. Is That's the single most surprising thing about these decades' worth of research on chess playing programs, what he just said. Okay. I think that's we all thought that. We were wrong. Mm -hmm. Murray was right. <laughs> <laughs> He's also right that, that, that learning is an orthogonal problem to problem solving. Can we, um, we got to be a little quicker. I'm going to limit the, the questions to 15 seconds. Yes, thank you. So you got to say what you want to say quick. Do you want me to talk name? really fast? I, I, oh, we're over here. I'm sorry. I lost my chance almost. Uh, thank you. Um, we human beings are uh, quite fallible. I, I want to. I want to say, you see, even chess grandmasters are often, you know, they just lose their mind, I guess, uh, sometimes. Uh, I asked uh, two grandmasters a question like, have you ever come across a two-way discovered check? And they never could answer that with a yes. Because I, I have myself come across that, and I don't know of any master game which has a two-way discovered check. Uh, I have not come across anything, but I have my own game once which had a two-way discover check. It is a part. I just want to say that. This is a different topic. This is the actual question I want to ask. Kasparov was beaten, let us say, by a machine thinking of, uh, say, um, uh, 10 plays. 10 plays of mouse uh, uh, in, in uh, every second or something like that. So uh, I'm saying if Kasparov is beaten, suppose somebody else comes up who is somewhat better than Kasparov. Now, will an 11 ply machine be required to beat this man? And that will take many centuries to produce. Now, uh, can you comment on that, please? Sure. Murray? I, I think uh, a, Moore's law it takes a, uh, shows that it, uh, it won't take many centuries. In fact, to create an, an additional ply of search is a factor of three or four in computation. So that's. You wait a few years. Sorry, I thought you spent 400 for a plot. No. Factor of three or four per, per ply. That's it. Every additional ply is about a factor of three. All right, listen, next question. OK, I, I have been interested in computer chess, but from the opposite point of view, and that is the human uh, point of view. And then I was going to ask David specifically a question. I've watched a lot of chess game, and I see the master sometimes slow down. And sometimes they, sometimes they move very quickly, almost, and they hit the clock, and they time themselves. And then sometimes they just slow down, and occasionally they just sit and sit and sit. And I've always wondered if I could put an MRI on their brain, and, or CAT scan, and see what's going on. Now, you're a chess master. Are you searching longer? Or, and how do you get psychologically beaten by a, you know, and why is your morale important? and you can be destroyed psychologically and you lose if this just is search and, and nothing else, or computations? Well, that, that's two questions. The, f the first question, are you searching um, longer when you're thinking a lo long time? When you're thinking a long time, it's because you're not satisfied that you've f yet found the right move in the position. Uh, you might sit and look at a position and feel, for example, that you're winning, but not see how to win. And you might have a, an intuitive feeling that there is an actually di a, a direct forced win in the position, but that you haven't found it yet. And in that type of situation, it's very tempting to sit and think for a very long time to try to find the forced win because that will end the game. Conversely, if you're defending, you might have an intu intuitive feeling that there is one way and one way only of saving the game, and you haven't yet found it. So that, again, gives you a good reason to think for a long time. As far as getting destroyed psychologically, I think it ha can happen to people in all sorts of problem-solving situations um, and certainly in all sorts of games where something happens that they weren't expecting or where they feel that they've 
um, not given of their best. There can be all sorts of psychological reasons why someone's morale crumbles in a, um, in, in a chess game. Playing chess is a very, very tense occupation. Um, one analogy I give is that imagine you're sitting an exam for your university degree and you're not allowed to cross out a single mistake. Think of the pressure that would be on you if you knew that you would fail the exam if your examiner found a single mistake. That's what it's like playing chess. Every move must be right. You make one mistake against a player like Kasparov and you're dead. That's why it can be so demoralizing if you feel you haven't given of your best. But after that demoralization happened, uh, did his searchability or computational thing went, got, became slower? Or Sorry, I can't hear you. Did, did he become a slower player because of this demoralization? Indirectly, yes. Or can he search when, through when the same space? You, you can, but when you become demoralized um, and depressed, it's very difficult to think clearly. And so you find yourself being distracted by the depression and just unable to think properly. Okay. Thank you, and, and Now, what did you mean by intuition? Uh, <laughs> well, you got to get the next question. Please. You're talking about uh, your name, please. Millisecond compute. Millisecond. Is it? We are talking about millisecond modern computers and petit transistors, okay? and yeah. and somebody mentioned constraining the space. I just want to talk about it. in 1979. Some of these people might be interested in here that uh, yeah. the Atari 2600 computer had a chess program. Short of cutting them off. Right? Which was done at a millisecond, or um, one megacycle computer, and it had 128 bytes. And I mean 128, I don't mean 128 kilobytes or anything. <laughs> I mean 128 bytes, and it stored the position. Now, the people there, they divided the program uh, up into somebody wrote the display and somebody wrote the uh, pr program. Does anybody who knew who wrote the program? Uh, wait, we, we, well, we the question is, uh, is, is a comment the to the, what you're talking about here that you could, this was, this was a good program, it would beat people that played chess in high school in 128 bytes at one megacycle. So what's the question? <laughs> okay. So there are some computer chess programs that run in a very small amount of memory. And I think that's the, I'm not sure if that's the answer to your question, but that's the case. Next question, please. My name is Ken Friedenbach, and I have one very quick question and one, one more substantial question. Um, and they both relate to the game of Go. Uh, we're here celebrating four decades or 40 years of computer chess. By my calculations, we're also 35 years into computer Go, since in 1970, Albert Zobrist wrote a thesis, and in 1971, Jonathan Ryder under John McCarthy wrote a program that Don Knuth played against. So I'm going to give a paper next month at the uh, third international conference on Beiduk, or, or Go as it's known in Korea, and at the Myeongji University in, in Korea, which has a department of Beiduk studies, and they have one course on computer Please, Go. the question. So my, my question is, would any of these experts be willing to guess how long it'll be before we have a, a, a Go program that can beat a, an international grandmaster? All right, we'll go down and, the table quickly. And then the, more, the, the other question would be, has anyone looked at the mathematical Go end games, not nightmares for professional Go players, where they fight over the last point on the board, and they've come up with an amazing array of numerical quantities that have very non-numeric uh, properties, and what does this tell us about adding together things like territory and position? And, okay, and the second, I think the second question is too complex to go into at this point, so I'm going to excuse the panel on it. But if we run down the table quickly on a number, Maybe we could get an opinion on the game of Go. Would anybody like to for John? Actually, the second question is the easiest answer. <laughs> uh, uh, namely, Elwin Burlikamp at Berkeley wrote a whole book, essentially, on uh, Go end games. And, and it turned out to be a pretty elaborate uh, mathematical theory. Now, as to the first one, uh, question, <clears throat> when will computers beat humans at Go? Uh, in my opinion, it requires a new idea. And um, uh, guessing how soon it will, a new idea of 
suitable magnitude will arise is, is just wild. What one can't say, at least I will claim you can't say, is that progress in computer speed or progress in human understanding of the game is uh, proceeding at some linear rate and all you have to do is divide the distance uh, that you have yet to go by the amount of, uh, uh, by the rate, and then you can calculate how long we'll get there. No, you can't do that yet. Um, can I disagree? Can I? I disagree with John. Um, I've actually done this computation, and it comes out at 35 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the reason, very simply, is that Go programs have been progressing at an average of half a queue a year for the David, last 20 years. David, we've got to move on. We've got 35 years from you. <laughs> and if you want to see this how I calculate it, buy my new book called Robots Unlimited, which is being published later this month. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've got... Uh, any comment, Ed? <laughs> Murray, a comment. 35 years, we've got plus or minus? I think 15 to 20 years. 15 now. to 20, so we've got an average of around 20 to 25. 25, something like that. Maybe my okay. son will make a bet with you, Murray. I think <laughs> Ed is taking down notes to make a wager with David or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> Would you like to ask the next question? Uh, my name is John Gaddy, and this question is for David. It, we were born the same year, and I realized how far you've evolved, and I'm still down in kindergarten with Jess. I, I remind my, when you told the story about the text, and he was better than I am. So uh, I have, over the years, tried to dabble in chess, and I picked up a couple of these games, Gaspro with the President, and Travel Champion 100, and, and had fun with them. Uh, how do you, you evaluate these games in the context of chess history, and, is there, and what game would you recommend today for the consumer to sit at home and try to develop themselves as a chess player? Well, I, I never re would recommend um, any particular program because each program has its pros and cons. I would say you need to find a program that can play at roughly the level, that has at least some levels of playing skill, roughly at your level, because that's the most enjoyable for you. You need programs that have some levels above your level of skill, so that when you beat the current level, you can move on upwards. Um, and you just have to look at the features and the playing strength and choose um, one that you think suits you. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Thank you very much, David. Uh, our last question. Of That's the, the last evening. one. I'll try to be quick. I'm Tom Cochran, working as a contractor over at NASA Ames, doing systems engineering. We're trying to design the next generation of spacecraft. And in order to go long distances away from Earth, we have to get away from the methodology of having 20, 20 or 30 controllers solving all of our problems for us because the communication lengths get too long. Um, it's a rather challenging game managing the various subsystems that interact on, on spacecraft. And I was fascinated by the comments about the discussion about how chess programs can be adaptive to even though they have major errors in them. I've been saying that the major barrier to human spaceflight right now is flight qualification of our software. And we're looking for five nines of reliability because we have so many different systems. We're afraid to fly unless we you know, put our, our friends at risk, unless we really have ways of verifying that it's true. So we've been stuck with much older methodologies for solving what are essentially very complex problems. So the question is basically, how do we do validation and verification on what's essentially an, an infinite state space of how the system's going to behave? Maybe Murray would be yeah, I, good on that. I can't say that Deep Blue was ever validated and verified. Uh, I'm sure uh, many bugs existed uh, even during the games with Kasparov. Um, it's just that chess is a complex enough game that uh, Many of the bugs never arose in, in the course of the six games that were played during the match and in, in the course of our testing. So it's such, as you said, it's such a large state space, it's very hard to comprehensively cover that space. And I don't have any great insights from our work that, that would help in that respect. Thank you, Murray. I, I just conclude with a couple of quick remarks. I, I, I really enjoyed the discussion that we've had 
it's always a very lively discussion, and when you have such a talented bunch of people on a, on a panel, it makes it extremely interesting. This is an incredibly talented bunch. We've, uh, looking through my own history of, of events in computer chess, this is possibly the most outstanding bunch of small number of people that I've been involved with, and I, I, I just want to thank the panel for, for uh, participating and spending the time here. And I'm sure all of you thank them and would give them a hand.